The Talking Points with the Training Center starts now. Welcome to another episode of Talking Points with the Training Center. I'm Ryan Ozell, Director of Player Development with the Training Center. Today we've got Head Coach Eric Wagley, uh, Dan Kabuling, owner of ID3 Training, and our special guest, Austin Byler from Major League University. In today's episode, we're going to be talking about how we can impact the mental game. Um, and with all this started, Austin, why don't we get ahead and uh, get a little background on you and, and what you, who you are and uh, what Major League University is and what your kind of focus is. Yeah, Ryan, thanks for having me, fellas. This is awesome. Super excited for it. And I love what you guys are doing at your guys' facility and with your teams that you have and the player development that you guys are rocking. But for, for me, background, grew up in Peoria, Arizona. So out here west, right by a lot of the spring training complexes. So we were always blessed to be able to play on spring training fields at a young age. I mean, I, I think we kind of took it for granted being here in high school, being able to go play on a professional field. But we had that opportunity all the time. So throughout high school games, got to go out there. And from there, Played four years of the high school on varsity. Had the opportunity my senior year after it was the last game of the year, May 25th. May 26th, we lose the championship. I get to go up to University of Nevada on a recruiting trip and sign with the University of Nevada, Reno, there in 2011, which was incredible. It was the best four years of my life. But um, just being able to go through really good competitive high school baseball into the University of Nevada, where there's really no offers for high school or started to go into college at that point. There was a couple of junior colleges and that was about it. So having all these great stats and having all this awesome stuff on the outside, there was no opportunity yet. And that's where I wanted to go was professional baseball, college baseball. So thankfully got that opportunity to go play at Nevada after a long wait there. And, and then went out there for four years, had the opportunity to get drafted twice, um, once out of my junior year. And then my next year came back to school and drafted that senior season in 2015 with the Arizona Diamondbacks and decided to sign and go play a couple of years there with them before getting released. And uh, once I got released, I decided to start Major League University. And our whole goal is to help inspire and develop the next generation of leaders. And through baseball, through football, through basketball, through all sports. I think it's all encompassing and it's all through the mental side of the game, peak performance, leadership development, mindset training to help athletes not only on the field, but off the field. And I think we're really seeing the mental health aspect within our athletes the last couple of years take off. It's been incredible just to see some of the statistics that are thrown around, but that's kind of our whole mission, man, being able to impact athletes through the mental side of the game, educating and equipping them with the tools that they need to be successful once the game ends, because we all know sitting in here that the game's going to end one day, but who are you aside from what you get to do? So that's really kind of what we're all about and super excited to kind of keep this thing rolling. Awesome, man. Well, that's great to hear. And, uh, you know, a little background. I, I know I sat in uh, when you were doing a little bit of a, a session with some guys in this area that are close to me. Um, so we kind of, you know, got to know each other from that. And uh, I took a lot from that. I felt like you were one of those guys who's really growing the game. You're trying to impact kids and, and uh, improve their mental skills, um, which has always been a big, important part for me. You know, I, I grew up getting my master's in sport and performance psychology and then uh, playing or baseball with my dad, who's been a high school baseball coach forever. Um, so one of the questions I kind of have for you as this is, is coming up is you've obviously played the game of baseball and had to uh, impact it from the mental side there and now being in a position with major league university and as a coach, how do you find a uh, balance that, that difference between playing with it, the mental skills and utilizing them there and now being able to teach it and, and teach it to, to kids on a regular basis? Ooh, that's a great, great question. It's a lot easier to teach it than to do it. That's for sure. Um, you can teach it all you want, but do you practice it is really what it comes down to. And uh, I think just being able to use the tools that you give the athletes they see that example in you. So if I'm telling you to do visualization, but I never visualize, how do I expect that athlete to go visualize their success? If I tell you to commit to working out in the, in the weight room three or four times a week, but I worked out once or twice a week and I, I, I catty cornered it and dogged it in the weight room, how can I expect you to go do that if I'm not holding myself to that high of a standard? So from playing with it, it was really evident to me, my junior season of college, it was we started to visualize. We had Coach Jay Johnson come in. He's at University of Arizona now. And he brought in three or four different speakers and, and guest peak performance experts, I guess you can call them. And they came in and did workshops with us. And every single one of them talked about visualization and the art of calming your breath, seeing success, and really realigning your mind and body together. And once that happened, I noticed a big uptake in production for our whole team. We had just about the same athletes on the team that sophomore year with the exception of a first rounder and another guy who got to go play for the Dimebacks. So we had a, I guess, lesser talented pitching staff, 
but we had way more production. We won 10 more games. And mind you, a lot of it's culture and how we practiced, but we visualized every day before practice and before games, six days a week. Every single time we were on the field, we did this. We implemented it into our game and made it a practice, made it a habit that we had to use. And we started to see the success. So that's when it really came to me. It was like, okay, wow, this is powerful. And so as a player, I used the visualization big time, being able to calm my breath, see my success, go through what's going to happen on the field before it even happens. So now my mind's been trained so my body can just react when I get out there. So I'm in a power, more powerful position to succeed. And that's where it hit home. I used it there, my, my senior season of college, and then my first year of pro ball. And through those three years at 40 something homers, led the league in all these categories offensively. And I saw how evident it was that this is the missing ingredient. It had nothing to do with my physical skill. And then getting in there after my, my first year of pro ball, I end up failing a drug test in that fall. And I go back into the spring and I'm mentally a wreck. So much anxiety, so much depression, was just uh, totally reactive to the world around me. And when I noticed that, I stopped doing the visualization. I stopped doing the tools, using these skills that helped me be productive as an athlete on and off the field. And not only my life on the field was worse and performance wise, but off the field, I felt like crap, man. I felt terrible. I was just swimming in my own dome all the time. Didn't want to get out of bed. Didn't want to go to the field. Didn't want to do anything. So I noticed this disconnect. And so after evaluating those next two years where I, instead of hitting 300, I hit 250. Instead of hitting 18 homers, I hit nine homers. Instead of leading the league in extra base hits and walks, I led the league in strikeouts. Like seeing all these results start to happen. I'm like, okay, there's a, there's a missing ingredient here. And it's for sure the mental side of the game and just life in general, using this tool. So as a coach, now I use the personal experience a lot to go back and say, hey, look, this is what happens when you use this tool. This is what happens when you ignore these tools. Your physical skill can only get you so far, but the mind is so powerful in our businesses, in our life, in our relationships, and who we hang around and what we do as people. It's the most powerful tool that we have. And why not start training it at an earlier age to allow us to be more productive and to give us the best chance to be successful and reach the dreams that we want to achieve. So as a coach, it's, it's not like putting it on you, like, Ryan, you need to do this, like do this or you're not playing. No, it's encouraging. Hey, this is what happened for me, sharing the personal stories. This is how this can help. And as we know, a lot of our athletes are going through mental health and, and different things off the field that are help or that are uh, hindering their on the field performance. So if we can give them some of these tools and just kind of almost walk them in like a baby as you start crawling then you start walking and you start running, like let's do it at a base level and then start to add up. We'll add some tools on top of this, but let me give you the, the base ingredients to the cookie mix and help you start to develop this skill in the side of the game. Awesome. Yeah, that's some great insight. One of the things that really came out from that to me was the idea of uh, leading by example. Um, that's a really big one and, and something that I, I think is good. Eric, I, I kind of want to turn this question to you as well. So um, Austin kind of mentioned the idea of culture and how the culture shapes um, the program and, and where the visualization and all those mental skills can come into the play. Um, you've been in different roles where you've had to lead and build cultures and, and do those types of things. Uh, how do you feel like that's been the case? And do you feel like that's a, a leading a culture is something that's a top down type of approach or is it something where it's all encompassing from, from all areas? I mean, I think it's definitely all encompassing, but obviously it's going to start at the top. Um, yeah, culture is a big one with me and uh, it's something that, you know, as I've kind of grown up as a coach, um, have made more and more important and evolved, you know, as a leader now of, of a large program. And it's, it's just, they're going to follow what you do and they're going to follow your words. And, and, you know, kids are, are pretty, pretty good BS detectors. And, uh, you know, if, if they, they, they figure things out pretty quick. So if you're saying something, but you're not backing it up, or if you're not embodying what you're saying, they turn off pretty quick. And, and in this world of kind of club baseball and training, um, you know, they get around a lot of voices and, and they gravitate towards the ones that are impactful to them. And uh, so creating that kind of, you know, like I call it a progressive culture, you know, uh, our class of 2020 is a really good example. You know, a few years ago when we started to get into this training and tech and kind of this really uh, I guess, new school approach to, to, to developing athletes. Uh, they've been our test babies, but now like, you know, whatever we throw at them, whatever new gadget we get in the training center and we give to them, um, they're all about it and, and they love it and they embrace it and they, they don't mind if it's a little weird. And I think that's just a culture that's been created uh, not only by us as the leaders of the program, Dan and I, but also just by them, you know, uh, they have fun with that stuff. And, and uh, now we have our younger players looking up to them and it's just, it's just normal in our facility to kind of be doing new things and trying different stuff. And, uh, Oh man, like, you know, what, what's that thing over there, coach, you know, let's, 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 let's play with it, you know? So 
um, yeah, it's been really good kind of creating that. It's, it's fun. It's a, it's a very fun culture to be in, in, in the facility. And I know, you know, we've been able to slowly but surely get up and running. And I, I thought, you know, the, the kind of the, the vibe on Thursday when we were there was really good and it just kind of started to feel back to normal. And, and, uh, you know, that all starts with kind of that, that culture aspect that we've been hitting on. Yeah, that's awesome. I think the, the part you mentioned, the open-mindedness of players is something that's really important. Uh, something that we've been really trying to preach for our guys is, is that idea of, you know, growth mindset, being open to different ideas, trying it and seeing what works for you. Um, you know, also, I think you kind of mentioned that as well as the idea, like you got to try it, you got to put your effort into it. There's times where you're going to find it. You're, there's other times where you're not going to find success with it. Um, and I think that kind of rolls really well into our next question, which is, you know, what areas do you tend to focus on when working with players and why you feel those areas tend to be the most valuable? Mm, great question. Yeah. I think a lot of it, a lot of what I do is the off the field. And a lot of people will say from the outside, it's like, Hey, like, what do you do in the game? What's the mental skills of the game? What's the mental side of the game? You see all this stuff on Twitter and Instagram and all these different people trying to get into it, which is great. That's awesome. But let me connect off the field. Let me share a story. So I think the biggest thing is commitment. How do we commit off the field? And in that training program that we ran there in January, you were, you were sitting in there, which was awesome to have you in there and be a part of that. And one of the biggest things we talked about was day one was commitment. Let's commit to something that's going to help build self-confidence. Because if I can commit to something every day, even if it's as simple as doing the dishes or doing my laundry or making my bed or doing a gratitude journal, whatever it might be, one little simple commitment can lead to so much more self-confidence, which on the field is going to in turn, hopefully increase your results and performance. So a lot of it's the commitment piece, visualization every single time. I think that's a key that, uh, that we can never give up on. We have to continue to preach that. I say visualization rather than meditation, because if you say meditation, sometimes the kids are like, whoa, hippie, like you're weird. What are you doing? Like, no, let's visualize. Let's see ourselves succeed. Let's see success before it happens. That tool is massive. Always want to teach that, but commitment is big time and developing confidence. And I think if we're confident human beings, we're going to in turn have better results in whatever we get to do. And people are going to pick up on that. I can pick up on if you're confident or not. And like you said, Eric, like kids are great BS detectors. They can see right through you. They see stuff all the time and they're distracted. We're all distracted as human beings. There's so much going on around us. How can we focus in on the things that are important to us right away? And I think this time that we've been going through the last couple of months is really making that evident. There's some people who are developing as real leaders and some leaders are being exposed who aren't actually able to lead. And when you see a kid who's following certain people and they attract and gravitate toward people who they can relate to, the commitment piece is huge. Getting them to believe in themselves is huge. Developing self-confidence is huge and building routines for their life. Not only pregame routines, but a failure routine. What can I do when I do fail? Because there's going to be failure in the game. We all know that. But how do I process through that to limit those slumps, limit the failures that do happen so it doesn't overtake me? And now I take that result on the field home to my mom and my girlfriend and then back into the morning into school and then back on the field the next game. So that's the real key is how do we develop self-confidence? How do we visualize? walk them through the process for that and then committing to yourself let's commit to ourselves for excellence every single day and it's not going to be easy it's going to be a challenge we get that but guess what let's make it as simple as possible for somebody to understand how to get to this next side of the game yeah that's great i think one of the things you mentioned uh is something we kind of talked about in the the facility this week was the idea of you practice to train you play to trust um putting that that plan into practice is where that trust comes from, is that a belief that you're putting in the work to do something that's gonna help you in the long term. Uh, one of the questions I got to kind of follow up on that is, a lot of these focuses you talked about, um, do they depend on age or do, they, do you feel like this is something that can be taught to somebody who's you know, a 10 year old who's just starting in baseball or do you think it's something that only like high school and high level players get to, to, to learn and how do they apply it? It's universal. It's universal of all ages, all aspects, all genders, all people, all ethnicities, all countries. I don't care where you live or what you look like. This is needed because when we have these mental health numbers that are staggering, and I know there was a guy told me the other day in the Contra Costa area or Contra Costa hospital, whatever it is, there's more deaths by suicide than there is from the actual COVID. Are you kidding me? but nobody's talking about mental health. We're not talking about our athletes and our kids, our children who are running around at eight, 10, 15 years old, who are addicted to these cell phones, wherever mine is, like these technology pieces from two, three, four, five, six years old. Now it's programmed in their mind. And that's really hard to break a habit that's been programmed at that young of an age. So 
I think it goes everywhere. And I think school systems need to adopt some sort of a, a, a program for these kids when they get into school. Maybe that first 30 minutes of their day, that, that first hour that they have is, let's work on ourselves. Let's have some personal development. Let's help each other become stronger and become better. Let's encourage each other. Let's push each other out of our comfort zone so we're not texting and Snapchatting. We're talking and having a conversation and breaking out of our shells and, and trusting ourselves and building that trust with each other. I think that's big time. So I think it goes with everyone. The terminology just changes. So when I talk to, say, a 10-year-old athlete or a 9-year-old athlete, the terminology is going to be a little different than with a 18, 22, 25-year-old high school, college pro athlete. But the whole overall concept it plays in all ages, all levels. I mean, we all need this stuff. Everybody in the world needs something like this to fall back on. We got to build our foundations for success. And I think just how you approach it with the athletes is going to be big time. But like I said, man, this needs to be in schools. This needs to be taught regularly. And people need to take a bigger focus on this because what do we all want to do? We all want the new hitting guru. We all want the new pitching coach and the velocity program that's going to give me 95, 99. But I can have all the physical ability throwing 95, 99. But if my mind's not right, I'm never going to get to the next level. My physical talent might take me to lower high A in professional baseball, but I didn't get to the big leagues because I couldn't figure out how to control the zone. Because when I got hit a little bit, my emotions got rattled, and now I couldn't control what was happening around me. If we can control what's inside of us, work on our internal belief system, that's going to lead to so much more success in all of our fields. Fulfillment, happiness, gratitude, the little things that kind of go either overlooked or they get dumbed down a little bit, I think those are big time. So I think it goes everywhere, Ryan, personally. Awesome. That's great to hear. I kind of want to throw this over to you, Dan. So. Um, you know, obviously we talk about this a lot with the baseball skill side, but obviously with you and, and the strength and conditioning and uh, movement type of stuff that you do, how do you feel like mental skills kind of uh, can be utilized? And is it something that um, has as much value on that side as you feel like in, in the baseball skill side? Massive. And it's funny, as you were talking about that outside, I, it, it's literally almost verbatim. What I say to an athlete is, Hey, we can work and develop physically. We can learn to move better. We can, we can get stronger. We can see all these things. But if you step into the batter's box and you say, I suck, I suck, I suck, it doesn't matter how hard you work. We all know those athletes who are monsters in the weight room who hit a ton of cage bombs and throw every single strike when, when they're in their bullpens. But when they get into games, it's like, who is that guy? That's, that's not the player that I've seen develop and get better. Um, so I try and create that like a feed forward, like positive cycle of I put the work in, you know, I, I see myself getting better. I, I get that vicarious experience of confidence in, in the process of getting better. And then I apply that mentality to, to uh, my skill work, to games, all that. And I think um, trying to create that cycle is, is really positive. So it's, it's, it's good to be, you know, see some of that and hear uh, affirmation from you of, of, of doing the same thing. So it's, uh, I, I, I call it that X factor. It's like that one, you know, all coaches talk about hard work. Not a lot of coaches talk about what's going on up here and what's happening in your mind. And again, if you can't have, you don't have control over that, then it, it doesn't matter what we do field, gym, whatever it may be. Like if, if we're our own worst enemy, we're, we're always going to be limited by that. If I could jump in there, um, you know, I used to give a lot of coaches clinics, not, not as much anymore, but I kind of tell the coaches, you know, uh, you know, what percentage of the game is mental? You know, I've never in all the coaches clinics I've give, have a coach answer less than 50%, you know, 60%, 70%, 80%, 90% mental. And then I always go, okay, well, uh, how much are you practicing the mental game in, in your practice structure? And they, uh, I don't know, you know, like, and it's, you know, either zero or, you know, there's no way any coach is dedicating 50, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90% of the time for actually the mental game. And, and that's a big disconnect that we try to bridge. Um, so, I mean, Austin, how, what are some examples of how you implement the mental game into either to a lesson or a small group work or, or, or a full practice, you know, like what are some ways to implement the mental game? Yeah. Great question, man. I think just starting off with, Asking questions, being a good listener is, is a big one. So listening to our athletes, how's your body feel? How's your mind feel? What's going on off the field? How's school going? Do we know if, if I know my athlete, do they go to a more prestigious high school or college where they're really stressed out with grades and stuff? Or is it like grades are the last thing I care about? I don't really care. I'm just here to hit. So I think getting to know them is really big, listening to them, and then implementing visualization within each practice program. I think if, if you're a head coach or if you're just a coach of any kind and you have a program or a team that you get to run, one minute equals six minutes of physical practice. So one minute of visualization equals six minutes of actually physically practicing. So why wouldn't we 
take one to three minutes to just sit there and breathe and see something happening. But whatever we want to do, maybe our intent for the day, our goals, our purposes, maybe it's just seeing my, my gratitude, whatever that might be, implementing that right away is huge. Even if it's, hey, let's, let's come up in a circle and let's talk about a subject. What's mental toughness mean to you? What does mindset mean to you? What, is, uh, what are some emotions that you feel when you're at your best? and some emotions when you're at your worst. And how can we get from the worst category into the best category more often? Just having these open conversations with our team is big time. So that's more of like a team group. In an individual setting, 60 minutes is really hard to fill a lesson. And when you just sit there and you just throw front toss and overhand, it's cool, yeah, mom and dad look awesome. Ooh, my son's taking a thousand hits. But we all know that when you take that many swings, it's doing nothing but making our athlete worse. So I like to at least the first five to 10 minutes, if that's what I'm doing in a specific type of environment, either let's visualize, I'm going to talk to him first, we're going to visualize after that, and we're going to get our mind right before we step into that cage or on the mound or on the field, so that I know you're at your best state of mind. Whatever's gone off or whatever's gone on off the field doesn't matter. When you step on here, this is what matters. This is our focus. Now let's breathe it and see it. It's one thing to tell them, just like you said, like, hey, work hard, work hard. Okay, great. We all know we got to work hard. But let's work smarter and let's get our minds right to help us become more successful on the field. So I think those are a couple of ways that you can kind of intertwine this and just start to mix in some of these lessons, especially if you haven't done it. But I love the fact that you mentioned, hey, we all know that it's 50% or more. We all know that majority of the game is the mental side, but most of us don't implement this at all into our practices, nor do we know how. And I think that's a big disconnect too, is maybe we just don't know how, or we're not doing a, a proper job enough of helping our coaches understand how to put this into their practice plan and make this a mandatory type of deal, just like we hit, just like we throw, just like we feel defense. I think, uh, you know, a, a big how is just releasing responsibility to the players. You know, I think it's a lot of coaches have a big problem kind of just letting players fail and figure things out on their own. But while, while we do that as coaches, we are enabling them to kind of have mental practice, you know, failing in practice or failing in a game on their own because they're allowed to kind of self-discover some things is great mental practice. Um, so yeah, even, even something as simple as that is just not, you know, letting players dictate what they do instead of the coaches dictate what they do is, is implementing the mental game, you yeah. know, to a certain degree. That's big. Yeah, I think. So far. I was going to say competition too, right? Let's compete. Let's yeah. fail, let's compete. Let's get better. That way you can learn something through that player. I love that you added that on. Yeah, and that's one of the ones that sometimes you see hitters that, you know, they have a bad round or something. And they, they're coming out and they're looking at you to, hey, well, what was I doing wrong? And sometimes it's not your necessarily your swing was wrong. Your, your mechanics were off. It was more of the approach you had. You weren't swinging at good pitches. You were late in your gather. You were late in your timing. Like all these types of things that come up. And sometimes it's best just to let those players sit and think about themselves. Uh, I feel like you kind of alluded to this earlier, Austin, in the sense that kids are so – focus on instant gratification with their phone and, and trying to get all of that answers, you know, the new, the new Velo program, the new hip power thing, whatever it is, it's going to get them to that next level instead of recognizing that it's a path. Like this isn't something where it's just one step after another and it's all going straight positive uh, forward. There's going to be times where you hit valleys. Um, you know, you mentioned the idea of slumps, like slumps happen. We're trying to figure out ways to limit those slumps. We're trying to figure out ways to make those slumps disappear a lot faster and giving those players that opportunity and the individual um, attention that they need, but also their own time to figure out how to, to make the adjustments and how to um, get themselves ready to to play again and, and make that that quick change before they go through that. You know, one of the ones that we really focused on this week was the idea of release and refocus. Um, we have too many times where guys get to into the cage and they just, they swing, they swing, they swing, they swing. Like you mentioned that idea of like a thousand swings instead of recognizing the ability to see the ball, see what happened, make the adjustment, learn from it, and then be able to adapt it into your next swing before you go into it. Um, I think it's funny that you guys, we kind of all mentioned these same similarities. And uh, on Instagram this week, uh, I don't know if you guys know, the outfielder Aquino from the Reds had a really great video of him uh, hitting on a tee where he basically made it like he was walking from the batter's box up to the tee, took it like his actual swing in the game, finished the swing, and then kind of like walked off. It was like, I'd rather see 10 of those from a player than a thousand rushed swings where they're, you know, they're trying to get everything done instead of really focusing, seeing the at bat, seeing the pitch, visualizing everything and going through and putting their best effort into it. That's mad. I love that. I love that. It's like, Hey, what, what is the quality of swings or what's the quality of intent that you're going to have on whatever it is, your bullpen. So just grabbing the ball going, let's take our deep breath, go through our refocus routine. Boom. Let me get locked in to be my best pitch. Or maybe it's on the field instead of in between ground balls, rushing 
And yes, some drills may have that, but I'd rather you take the quality ones. I mean, I know all of you guys would too. Like, hey, let's get better here. I'm not, you're not here for the hour to drain you physically. If you want to do that, then go in, go in the weight room with Dan and you can do your thing in there with him. When you're out here, we're going to get better. And you getting better doesn't mean I'm going to hit a thousand fungos at you when you're moving all day, or I'm going to make you swing all day. Or I'm going to make you throw a thousand long toss balls and then a bullpen and then drive line and then this and that. Like, let's be quality. I don't care if it's, if it's 10 or 15, like you said, right? I think that's massive, dude. And especially for athletes to hear that because it's easy to get caught up in the sauce, man. Especially when you see it through Twitter and Instagram, you see all this cool PVC stuff and boom, boom, boom. Let's be quality. Let's, let's take our time with what we do in between pitches. So big. I got a, I got a quick one just to kind of build off uh, awesome what you're talking about with the, the communication. And mm. I think one of the strengths that we have as, as a group, I kind of, kind of dubbed ourselves the three-headed monster where, where I think we work really, really well together. And, and as we continue to get more and more time in the facility, um, I think a piece that we've learned is certain athletes, like you're saying, attract to certain coaches. And then that we do a good job of communicating, uh, Eric specifically, I have more experience doing this, communicating back and forth about certain athletes and, and how they're feeling physically, mentally, whatever it may be. Uh, do you have any go-to kind of like when you see a new uh, athlete coming in, like what's your go-to, Hey, how's it going? Like what, what's your, how do you open them up for, and, and get more information from them? Um, you know, do you have any, any insight on that? Yeah. The, the first thing I ask is how are you feeling? How are you doing? Or I'll pump them up. I think encouragement allows us to get some vulnerability out of the athletes. So encourage them. Hey man, you're looking good today. How's it going? How are you feeling? Cool. Like what's going on? What's in your mind? Like that's the biggest thing. Like what's going on in your mind right now? Well, this because if you ask them how they're feeling and they're like, I feel good, right? Most guys are like, I'm good. Okay, cool. Let's go hit. Okay, cool. You feel good. All right. How's your body? How's your body feeling? You sore at all? Do you have any sore, any tightness? How's this going? Hey, my arm's a little sore. Okay, cool. How's your mind? How's school? How's um, life at home? Like, how are you doing off the field? Are you feeling good? Is you, are you confident or is there something going on? Usually, once you start just asking good questions to them, they'll start to open up a little bit. So I think just just getting to the bottom of it, like, hey, let's just ask questions. If they're good, they're good. And maybe throughout it, we can we can notice something where my athlete's like bad body language, hanging his head, looking down after every swing, like really frustrated. And that's where we call a timeout every single time, TV timeout. Hey, let's take a let's take a second to talk about this. What's going on? Like, what are you feeling with your swing? What are you feeling with your mindset? How's your body right now? Like, just asking them those simple questions, I think, will allow us to kind of break through the cocoon a little bit and start to open up a little bit more with them. But it's just simple as listening to them, you know, just listening to them. Even if it's an off the field deal, hey, uh, your Fortnite was awesome. Or this video game that you played was really cool, dude. I saw the video on Twitter or Instagram that you posted. It was so sweet. That was so cool. How was your weekend? Right. I think a lot of times we forget that recognition. Like when somebody recognizes you, it feels good. When Ryan calls for me to come to a podcast, I get pumped up. Or if I have him on my podcast, he's pumped up, I hope. And we get pumped. Or like if a guy's like, hey, I'm calling on you in the seventh inning to come pitch. Nice. Coach called on me. Let's go. You recognize him. Johnny, great play in the outfield. Hey, Jimmy, great swing in that third inning where you drove that ball to left center. He caught it, but it was a great swing. You're like, oh, I did something good. Because sometimes we have to, we have to realize that sometimes these kids aren't getting it at home. They're not getting recognition. They're not getting that love and support that some of us have been blessed with. So if we're able to just continue to encourage them, continue to love on them, give them the best, make them like the, the hero of the situation, I think they start to open up to us a little more. I think a big one with that, um, just, just kind of piggybacking on what Austin said, and something I consciously try to do quite a bit is just asking kids non-baseball related questions. You know, mm -hmm. I try to make a point to kind of ask each kid over the course of a week just something outside of baseball you know usually it's how was school uh you know what'd you do over the weekend just something simple you know how are your parents and then that allow, allows them to understand that you care about them more than just a baseball player and then they start to get more comfortable and then as they get more comfortable and they talk to you more then you can get some deeper nuggets and ask them more specific questions um i'm not saying i'm perfect at it but i definitely try to do it and i try to implore our coaches to do it just you know all all i tell our coaches you should know what school they go to you should know what what their parents' names are, you should know what grade they're in, you know, all those things are, are, they, are that personal connection. And then all of a sudden you can coach them a hell of a lot better in baseball if you have that personal connection with them. Good question and your answer is good. Like good's not uh, an acceptable, like one word answers and good or great or whatever it may be. And, and it sometimes turns into a joke, but it's like, that's, that's not the answer I'm looking for. I, I want some details. I, I, <laughs> I'm not just looking for the, hey, good, and then just go off and do your workout. So uh, <laughs> it's hilarious that you, you, I'm sure we all have experienced that where, how's your arm feel? Good. How's your back? Oh, good. How's your, how's the swing? How, like, oh, good. It's like, we're, we're, we need more. 
Yeah. And that one question that you uh, mentioned, Austin, that idea of, well, what's going on in your mind? I love that question because I think that's one of those ones where that gives them an opportunity to stop, pause, and really think about what they're actually, what is going on in their mind. Sometimes we get too fast in what we're trying to worry about and we forget that our mind has some time to process things and it needs to, needs to process, needs to work. Um, so giving them that opportunity sometimes just to say like, well, wh what's going on? What's in your mind? Like, what are you thinking about as you're doing this? Or why are you thinking what you're thinking? Um, just to get a better understanding and like Eric was mentioning that building that connection with those players. I think that's great. Move into our next question, which is the idea of um, how do we blend technology with mental skills? We've obviously had a situation where we've all had to push a lot more heavily into the social media, into our um, technology areas because of what's going on with COVID and everything. So Austin, how have you kind of blended technology with your mental skills and how have you had to adapt during this time frame? Yeah, that's a great question, man. It's one, uh, getting accustomed to Zoom and getting better at it has been huge. Like, okay, how do you host a webinar? How do you do this? How do you connect with a group of athletes on all these little screens and make them st like still get across to them? That's been a big challenge. It's been really fun to like discover that and kind of dig deeper into that aspect. But I think just blending it a little bit as far as that goes is you got to be vulnerable. You've got to be open. You've got to be honest and they can see your energy. So if I'm sitting here and I'm, I'm really like slapped back, my body language sucks. And I'm like this trying to talk to you, you're not going to care. Like I'm not going to connect with the athlete, but if I'm like in it, like fired up, like looking around the screen, like getting pumped up with them, they're going to feel my energy. They're going to connect with me more, especially the, the younger generation of athletes. So that's been a, a big trick, I guess, of one, good, good enough lighting to make it so they can actually see me and not everything in my back and I'm not doing the best job here, but it's better than what I had. And then two, just being honest and open with them. Hey guys, this is what was going on. Let's get to the bottom of this. I'm gonna ask you a question if, we're, if I'm working with the team. It's like, hey, I'm gonna ask you a question at the end of this, make sure that you have an answer ready for us just to get them engaged. Because the first few that I did, just went through the spiel. Anybody got any questions and nobody's going to say anything. They all mute on and it's like, okay, I didn't get a body reaction. I didn't get a, a smile. I couldn't see the smile. I couldn't see like a laugh or anything. You got to really like trust your, trust your abilities. And so with that, I think just making the athletes understand, Hey, this is a conversation. I'm not just going to speak to you. This is going to be a conversation. We're going to get through this together. We are here together with um, Jesse, I forget his last name, but he's one of the Astros middle strength coordinators. And he, he mentioned something a couple of months ago about asking what questions rather than why questions. Why did you do that? Why would you do that? Why did you do this? Rather than what were you thinking during this experience? What's going on in your mind? What's going on at home? You know, just simple, uh, something as simple as that. Why versus what is huge with the connection, bringing them in and then sharing your story. Share your story, wherever you played, whatever you did, what you went through, some things that led you to do what you do now is going to be big for that connection with the athletes. So I think just in general, just be there for them. They can sense that. People can sense that if we really care about them, if we don't care at all about them, if we care what they're saying or if they don't care what they're saying. And then helping them be prepared in technology is big time because in person you can say, hey, we're going to sit up. We're all going to be in front of me. We're all going to meet right here by the mound and you're all going to face me. But in a, in a call, you get on a call and one guy's got his hat like this. The other one's got a beanie on and like slumped down in the corner somebody's still in their sheets at 3 p.m in the afternoon like you've got to deal with some obstacles and sometimes when you're speaking to it if you just have it on speaker view the one person that pops up is usually the one that you know is not listening at all or has like the worst background you're like dang it now i'm speaking to this person they have no idea and that's just on my screen so i think another uh, halftime adjustment is going into the multiple views so you can kind of scatter around, uh, but so technology is awesome, man. Using it for the greater good, using it for the greater good. And when you think of like real technology that you guys are using in your Cajun facility, applying it when it's right and not getting lost in the sauce and keeping that as the, the end all be all. And I love what you guys are doing with the middle game and you're incorporating that because some athletes are going to go in there, they're going to hit the rap soda and do all this stuff with their spin rates and everything, get caught up in it. Or my velo, that's all I care about. Well, there's more to the game. And we're going to teach you more of the game. And there's more to life than what your stats on this little piece of paper say. We're going to help you prepare for real failure, right? We're going to help you prepare for real tough pressure situations in the game that are actually going to matter rather than I threw 83 today instead of 85. Okay, whoop do you do? Did you throw strikes? Did you hit your spots? Did you do this? Just making them feel loved is a big one. I was going to say, I think that the idea of using technology can also be utilized in a lot of different ways. Like one of the things I like to do with players is I like to send them different things um, like videos I see, like I, I saw a, a video this week of a drill that the guy was doing and I sent it to one of our guys because it felt like 
it could be something he could learn from and something that he could apply. And I feel like that all goes right to that mental skills as well. And instead of saying like, oh, go do this, it was more of a, why do you think this player does this drill? Or why do you feel like this is being done um, in this situation so that they start to think about it a little bit more. Um, you know, there's another one where I sent a video to one of our other guys and I was like, why does this guy move this way? What is he trying to do that you could also do similarly? Um, just to kind of keep that focus for them and, and bridge the gap between what we talked about in person um, to then what they're, you know, like we talked about, they're always on there. They got their phones with them. And we're the same way. Why not utilize it? Why not share it and be able to, to blend that kind of topic with everybody? One part as we've gone through these and uh, we just rolled out a new uh, assessment process you know uh, and some of it might be an information overload depending on the athlete but uh, as we've gone through a couple of them um, I think the part that is, is the cool part is we start finding like plus plus tools that you wouldn't see on the surface level where when you evaluate a player just from from a you know the eye test when they look at them you know the average high school kid does not look like they're going to be a college baseball player there's there's a one percenters are out there that you know are six five and are monsters but as we've gone into whether it's uh, you know looking at the the design or quality of their pitches or looking at their swing metrics or looking at some of them from a physical standpoint, and I feel like as we go through the assessment, we we actually lean more towards the stuff they're really good at. And it's like, hey, you could be really really good. We just need to clean up these other things, and we know how to help you. And we're going to use the technology to hold all of us accountable. We've been talking about that that a lot. I think that confidence as as a staff, uh, and also you know again catching those athletes doing something successful. Hey, you have this on your fastball and it's a plus tool. We have no clue how or why you have it, but you have it. <laughs> and let's, let's build on that. Uh, and I think that's something that uh, is kind of that, again, the sauce, the X factor that we, we don't directly talk about. It just naturally happens as we start applying uh, tech to, to player evaluations and, and player development. It's really good. I love it. I took it. I saw a little bit of the, the player evaluations that you guys had on social media. It looks awesome. Just getting a better understanding of your athletes. I, I think it's awesome. Took advantage of the opportunity. Very good. Yeah, definitely an area that we're trying to make some adjustments on. So I guess my last question here for you, Austin, is uh, it's a big one. And it's how do we get young players to take the mental game and, and take it seriously? You know, obviously we all understand the value that comes from it. We've put it into practice. We, we preach about it. We talk about it. But how do we get them to really take it and, and put their own focus on it, their own spin on it, and, and go and utilize it? That's the, that's the toughest part of what we do as coaches, as athletes, as people, as, as performers, as coach, whatever you want to say we are, like of helping athletes understand this. I think there's a couple of things. One, celebrate the little victories. So always praise success, always praise the things that they did well, and then make opportunities to do that. So whether you said, hey, that was a great mental toughness there when you, when you use that skill or – Look at the visualization for 60 seconds. Great job. Yeah, it was tough, but you got through. You did a good job. You didn't open your eyes. You were able to breathe, and, and you noticed that you felt calmer. I see in your face that you feel calmer and more focused in and, and aligned with who you are. That's a big way. And then, two, ask them, how is it going to feel if you got to the big leagues and you were in that – you got you got your first at-bat. You're in Chase Field or you're in the Giants Stadium. You got your first at-bat in the big leagues. You've made it all this way because your physical skill has, has gifted you and blessed you to get this opportunity to be in the big leagues. You're there. You get called up. You get in there, and you choke because you're not mentally prepared enough. Like, you did everything physically to be there. You worked out hard. You're jacked. You're massive. You're 6'5", 240. You hit bombs. Everything's good on the outside. You had great stats. But when you got to the big leagues, when it mattered most and your mind really had to take over to allow you to be consistent, you – choked you gave up you weren't able to be mentally tough enough in that situation how would that feel and when you ask an athlete that i think it really paints a picture like oh my gosh okay i got to that point i want to play for a while and that's my dream like now you're touching my dream like don't take my dream from me i don't want you to strip that success from me i've gotten there because i'm so gifted but i wasn't able to stay there because my mind didn't allow me to and when you ask them that question i think it opens them up a little bit and it gets them a little more buy into it like okay maybe this is important and then you compare it to Michael Phelps, Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant, Mike Trout, Clayton Kershaw, all the best performers in the, in the world of all athletes. They use these tools. They work on this side actively. They're actively working on this side to get better. And if you want to be that one day, don't you think that you need to maybe utilize some of these tools that are going to help you get there? Because the worst thing that can happen is when you get to your 18 years old and you wish you would have played college baseball because that was your dream, but you didn't make it because 
for some reason you had this massive slump because your mind got in your way of succeeding. It's a constant me versus me game. I'm painting that picture with them that, hey, it's, it's me versus me. When I step in the box, it's me versus me. When I'm on the mound, it's me versus me. It's not me versus you on the, on the mound. No, because you can throw whatever you want, but if I'm not mentally prepared enough, I'm never going to succeed. Like we mentioned earlier, we can do all the stuff off the field to help us be, be successful physically. But when I step in there, if I don't have that confidence, if I don't have that it factor, if I don't have a belief in myself that I can get through this and push through and be the best version of myself every day, it's never going to happen. So painting the picture for him to say, hey, man, how would it feel if you did get there and you were allowed to, like, you had that opportunity, but it got taken away from you because you weren't mentally prepared enough to stick around and to be in the big leagues for the continuation of your career? Yeah, I love how you mentioned the kind of like preparing for the moment. Um, it's that idea that sometimes you only get one chance. Um, you know, a lot of guys, you know, especially we're, we deal with more of the high school guys right now, but, you know, getting that opportunity or going to that, that one event that's going to have your ability to be shown and, and, and get somebody to, to pay attention to you to get you to that next step. You got to be ready for that moment. You got to be able to embrace that moment and be ready to go and, and know that I'm going to go put it all out there. Like this is the day that I got to go and let it loose. Like the, I, I've done all the work. I've taken everything I've gone through and this is now what I'm, I'm putting the focus for. Um, so I love that kind of concept that you have right there for it. 100%. And, and uh, one of the FCA guys at, at University of Arizona mentioned the other day, he said, are you praying for opportunities or are you praying to be prepared for the opportunities that you're given? And it smacked me in the face and I'm like, whoa. So many times we catch ourselves hoping for opportunities, wishing for opportunities to arise. Oh, when I get that D1 scholarship, when, I, when I'm allowed to speak in front of the University of Stanford football team and I get to fire them up, like when I get there, everything will be good. But no, I need to be preparing so when those opportunities do come up, I'm ready. Mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, all across the board, I am locked in, ready to go. And if I'm not preparing myself that way, I'm going to get exposed when I do get to that, when I do get that opportunity. So that's just something that kind of painted the picture for me that really hit home. I'm like, man, that's pretty powerful. Awesome. Well, I think those are the last of the questions. Eric or Dan, you guys got anyone else that you want to throw in here for your Austin? Oh, that was perfect. Great, man. Austin, where can people find you? How can uh, people get a hold of you and uh, how can you get a hold of people else? Yeah, 100%. You can always go to majorleagueuniversity.com, reach out to us, uh, email as well. And then social media, Major League University on Instagram, Major University on Twitter. If you want to find the personal Austin Byler on Instagram, Austin Byler 14 on Twitter, pretty simple. Uh, we got a Facebook page as well. If you want to check out some of the live podcasts that we got, Champion School, having different people come on in this field, coaches, et cetera, coming on, sharing their stories and pumping people up, man. It's all about culture, mindset, and leadership. I think my three, the big three, just like you guys are the big three, man. That's my big three in my mind. I'm like, man, I love this stuff. It fires me up so I could talk this all day. But anywhere on social media, you can reach out. And please reach out. I'm here to help. I'm going to respond to everybody and anybody. I don't care what you look like or what you do, uh, what age you are. We'll help in any way. And I'm just really blessed for this opportunity, fellas. Awesome. We love having you on, man. It was great there. And uh, we'll definitely have to get you back into the training center and talk to some of our guys a little bit more as we get going more with it. Yeah. I want to check out your place, man. I, I get to see the sauce on the outside, man, but it's like, it's that it factor. I see it from the outside. Now I got to make my way there, man. You better be careful though. I might make myself a room in the back. <laughs> <laughs> we got the space for you, man. Come on in. Oh. <laughs> we appreciate you coming on today. And uh, until the next time, keep developing. Thanks fellas. Appreciate you guys. Be sure to follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Dub Baseball, at ID3 Training, and at Ozella Baseball. Thanks for joining us on the Talking Points podcast. Until next time, keep developing. Hey!